James, thank you for joining me here in uh, San Francisco. Um, great to catch up with you. So you've been involved in the world of digital and pharma for quite a while now, really since the beginnings of this developing. Tell me a bit about your career and the kind of journey that it's taken you on. Certainly, thanks for asking. Um, in terms of my journey, I started actually in science. So I was studying neuroscience and um, neuroscience is quite technical. So you do a lot of work with uh, software and hardware and it was the uh, late 90s and I realized that this was really going to change things in science and healthcare. So I went looking for a job and the Silicon Valley came, came calling. So I spent about five years as a software engineer, always intending to go back into the healthcare industry. So I was very fortunate and uh, was hired by Genentech for a number of years, worked for them in Roche, then Novartis, um, and now UCB. So it's really interesting, as you know, if you've been doing this for 10, 12, 15 years, is you see the evolution from um, very loose ideas about how you can simply distribute content differently. Then you start looking at engagement, you start looking at education. And then more recently, it gets quite exciting because you're able to start looking at outcomes and technologies which can really help with healthcare. Yeah. So like you say, very early on, we talked about digital and pharma. It was really about communications, marketing, all of that kind of side. But it's really opened up recently. So if we look at your current role at UCB, it's about a much broader kind of uh, almost digital therapeutics, isn't it? Absolutely. So this is where it gets interesting because digital health is uh, quite complex and you have everything uh, ranging from um, uh, content and engagement, which actually can have an impact on the patient experience. But then more recently, as you started to get technologies where there is something called digital therapeutics or where you can start looking at uh, digital diagnostics, these are areas that complement uh, all of the original digital health. And if you think about it, it makes quite a lot of sense because just like the healthcare industry has many facets, the digital healthcare industry has many facets. Well, we have lots of terms and it's almost like there's no, no common lexicon for what is digital health and the different components. Do you think that complicates things a little bit? Absolutely. So, so it's a bit funny, but one of the most, um, most well-received um, talks that I've given and done a few times now is simply trying to look at the digital taxonomy or the digital health taxonomy. And this came up uh, in the Digital Therapeutics Conference earlier this year as well, where people are really having a, a very earnest debate about where does digital health and digital therapeutics, how do they overlap? Is one an umbrella of the other? Uh, is digital diagnostics mean uh, something used in clinic? Where does consumer health fit in? And, and really, um, there's no right or wrong answer, but if you look at the exits last year, you'll see some analysts um, having Peloton as a, as a digital health exit, which is fascinating. Or you'll see other analysts looking at Viva as a, a digital health exit. And, and this is fine, but as a digital health practitioner working at a company, you need to be able to say, for us, digital health is digital therapeutics, yep. uh, digital content, you know, so you have to have a very good feeling for, for the spectrum. So let's talk about digital therapeutics because we've been talking about beyond the pill for many years. But digital therapeutics is something very different. Describe to me you know, how you would describe that space and what it is. Absolutely. So again, there, there are a range of opinions, but I'm much aligned with there's a Digital Therapeutics Alliance uh, in the United States and I, I believe with a few of the European companies joining in as well. And uh, there are a couple important facets to this. So first of all, like a traditional therapeutic, there is validated evidence that it works. So you go through some sort of validated regulatory pathway, most likely the FDA or the EMA. Uh, and the second thing is after you have this validation, you actually have a prescription. The prescription is written and reimbursed. So for me, this is digital therapeutic. Now, there are other um, uh, tools which a, a patient may consume and it may indeed help with an outcome and they may even pay for that. But it, for it to be a digital therapeutic, my focus is on it being something you know, uh, validation, a regulatory pathway, and prescription. So the development cycle is obviously much, much quicker for a digital therapeutic, but do you think we're almost at a point where they're being evaluated in the same way as medicine, so by the regulatory authorities in terms of reimbursement? Well, how close to that are we? That's a great question. And 
And actually, I mean, how the regulatory authorities are looking at traditional medicines is shifting a bit as well, right? So in terms of the burden pre-market and the burden post-market, as you get more ability to look at post-market data. So I think there are two, maybe there's one similarity, which is that there is a burden of, of evidence. You can't just throw out a piece of software and, and claim it does something without some evidence. But I think where the authorities are doing a really good job is that they're allowing for quicker cycles um, so you can more quickly adjust and improve the software. And they are really focusing on a larger burden of evidence after you get into the market so you're able to get real data. And I think they're doing a good job as well at looking at, um, relatively speaking, the risk versus the return and helping with the therapeutics moving more quickly through the pipeline. So if we look at your role at UCB, I guess part of your job is taking a traditional pharma company with all the great work it does and helping it transition to embrace digital therapeutics in this new digital health environment. Can you talk a bit about the strategy of UCB and where you see things going? Absolutely. UCB is a fascinating company. So it's a, a mid-sized pharma company. And uh, one thing interesting about that is it really gives a bit more agility sometimes than some of the, the large companies. So that's one interesting thing. And the second one is UCB is very mission driven. So it's been looking at patient value since you know before digital came into the picture. So when you combine a company with some agility with a company that has a very mission driven culture, um, the ingredients are right to really move digital forward. The complications as always are that different parts of the business are likely to use digital in different ways. Right. So your research group, your development group, and your commercial groups are all going to have a different perspective. So a big piece of my job is to understand very well what each of these groups is looking at, what the thread between them is, and then try to be able to explain in a way that suits a researcher uh, versus a, a clinical development uh, um, a group, you know, versus someone in post-market, try to explain that actually the digital therapeutics or the digital health initiatives can help each of them in a slightly different way because I think these teams are not used to thinking about something that, that crosses all of those silos. And in terms of product development, you probably couldn't get further apart than pharmaceuticals with you know, 10, 15, 20 year development cycles and technology, which is very, very rapid. How do you try and bridge that gap? <laughs> uh, it, it's a challenge, right? I, I, I can't give uh, a, one answer. I, I think probably what I found recently to be the most valuable is uh, spending a lot of time trying to listen and understand the concerns of the counterparts in, in drug development, as an example. Um, and likewise, convincing them that it's worthwhile listening to the people who are doing digital health. So I think there's a bit of a communication or a culture divide where they're trying to convey the importance of the, the way that they approach things to get the, the level of evidence, the validity and things like this. And they have a, a bit of uh, natural skepticism for something that sort of has a lot of um, uh, you know, a flash lately and everyone's very excited about it. And they want to make sure that people who are talking about digital in the development cycles understand the complexity of what they're dealing with. Right. So one of the things I've really been focusing on is making sure that uh, my colleagues or, or people on my team are really paying attention to the why behind the concerns that are raised by a development team and also thinking creatively. Um, you know, there are times where if you're working on something which is an exploratory endpoint, you may be able to uh, remove a bit of this or a bit of that that you'd like in from a digital perspective but the give and take between the teams is really what makes it important. So the neuroscience space, it seems to me, is particularly vibrant for digital health. There's a lot of applications and technologies springing up. Why do you think we're seeing so much growth in this area? Great question. So I think there are three therapeutic areas that are brilliant for, for digital health and digital therapeutics. Oncology is one, cardiometabolic and, and neuroscience is the third. So speaking of neuroscience specifically, what's fascinating there is that they're not good endpoints, they're not good digital biomarkers, they're not good ways to measure uh, changes in cognition, there are not good uh, ways to measure changes in tremor, or if you're looking at a seizure, uh, how long a seizure lasts. There's still questions at the doctor's office. Uh, in many cases with neurodegeneration, it's still about you know moving your finger to your nose. You have, uh, um, whether neurodegeneration or whether an epilepsy, you have a lot of inter-rater variability. You can give an epileptologist um, three, an EEG sample to three epileptologists and you can come up with three opinions, right? So it's an area where the, just the, the lack of clearly defined measurements uh, isn't there and that presents a fantastic opportunity for a company like ours. So a couple more things I'd like to ask you. So 
As we see this digital health landscape evolve and we see pharma companies evolve, what do you think will be the key changes? What will a pharma company look like in maybe 10 years time if it's really embracing digital health? It's a great question. So with it, a complex ecosystem, and I think no one disputes that, we have a, a very complex healthcare ecosystem and an equally complex technology ecosystem, it's going to be about partnerships. So it's going to be about how you put together a stack of multiple partners who can work effectively together. And to work effectively together, you have to have on both sides the skill sets that allow people to translate between what the goals of a pharma company are, what the goals of a development program are, but also can understand the whys behind the technology. So sometimes it might seem simple to say, um, we should remove this bit of an interface or we should do it this way. And, and that's a bit of the old way of thinking for healthcare, of saying, um, you know, you must do it like this. Uh, and understanding the software development cycle or the effort that's put into making sure you have good software. So the pharma companies are going to need to have people who can truly understand the rationale behind why the technology companies are approaching in a certain way. And likewise, the technology companies are absolutely going to have people who understand pharma. Um, a simple example, if I might. We had a conference and people really were tickled at this, which I was asking the technology companies, can you describe to me the difference between research and development? Right? So it's a simple, it's a simple question. Yeah, yeah. But if you're running a technology company and you cannot tell me the cultural difference between a research organization and a development organization, you're going to struggle. Yeah. So on that point, you see a lot of digital health companies and novel technologies coming through. It's a really exciting time but they're not all going to succeed. So, you know, based on your experience within Pharma, what advice would you give to digital health companies for them to be successful? Uh, I guess two, maybe three things. So the first is really think about your leadership and your people, your culture at the, at the company, right? So it's not about, um, do you have the, the shiniest kit? You know, are you doing something 10% better than they, the other company? Really make sure you have the, the quality personnel within your company. And the reason for that is you need to do two things with those quality people. You need to be able to listen to your partners. So again, you really need to be able to understand both directly and between the lines what your partners are saying. And then the second thing is you really be, have to be able to crystallize the problem that you and they are trying to solve. Because chances are you're trying to solve one problem, they're trying to solve another problem, and the overlap is where you're going to get the win. So you really need people who are able to do that. Great advice. James, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. It was nice. Thank you.